Hi everybody, this is Brian Odegaard. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Florida, and I'm also the PI of the Perception, Attention, and Consciousness Laboratory here on campus at UF. In this video, as part of the Consciousness Recruitment 2020 initiative, I'll be telling you a bit about the work that my lab is currently doing. And I wanna start by giving special thanks to Cody Cushing, Taylor Webb, and Hakwan Lau for organizing this online meeting as well as Matthias Michel for his efforts in making this possible. So whether you're a prospective student looking to join my laboratory or simply someone looking to learn more about the work that we do, I hope you find this video informative. So we're a small but growing research team currently made up of myself, lab manager Addison Sands, incoming graduate student Sara Branjan, as well as nine bright and enthusiastic undergraduate research assistants that just joined the lab this past summer. So for you prospective students that are watching this, please note that I'm recruiting one fully funded PhD student in this admission cycle. So if you're looking to apply and learn more about the program, please check out that link down below on this screen. Our experimental approach in the laboratory uses an array of different methods, including behavioral studies to investigate perceptual decision making, um, eye tracking to study the relationship between eye movements and visual awareness, Neuroimaging, and specifically we use functional magnetic resonance imaging to decode both conscious and unconscious contents of the mind, and computational modeling investigations to, to study the principles by which the brain interprets the sensory world. So in this video, I'm going to describe three active areas of research in the lab that relate to the scientific study of consciousness. So while this video won't be an exhaustive overview of all of the projects we work on and all of the different methods we use, it should give you a good indication of the types of research that we work on to study consciousness in particular. So using scientific tools to study consciousness is an ambitious aim and consciousness itself is a term that means many different things to different people. So I thought I'd start by providing a definition for the term consciousness. Now, one helpful definition for this term comes from a recent review paper by Chris Frith, who defined consciousness as our capacity to have subjective experiences, which are characterized by particular content. So specifically, this means that we have a unique first person perspective on the world, characterized by the fact that there is something it is like to be who we are, and that the experiences that we have are characterized by specific qualities, including sights, sounds, smells, emotions, and other aspects of phenomenological content. Now, one logical question that follows from this definition is, how can we isolate consciousness as an experimental variable? My research group aims to identify and exploit useful scientific paradigms to better understand the behavioral, computational, and neural correlates of subjective experience. So in the majority of our experiments, we have a specific focus on studying visual subjective experience. In most studies in the lab, a typical experimental trial might involve a participant viewing a visual stimulus like the apple shown here. And then what they would do is process that stimulus for a short amount of time and then respond with some type of judgment about what was seen. To isolate subjective experience as an experimental variable, it might seem reasonable to compare this condition that you can see in panel A to a condition in which the subject had no experience of the apple. But you can quickly see that this is riddled by different confounds. So in addition to subjective experience being different between panel A and panel B, the motor behavior for the response differs between these two conditions, as well as the cognitive components of processing the apple in addition to possible differences in the strength of perceptual processing in the brain. So ideally what you want is to create experiments in which the conditions for perceptual processing and behavior are the same across two conditions and only subjective awareness of the stimulus differs. So this type of contrast can be found in the differences between panel A and panel C shown here where in C, the performance on a perceptual task has been matched across conditions. You have the same behavior marked by that little finger symbol, but what's different is the subjective report about what was experienced. So we think that this experimental design represents one useful way to try to isolate conscious subjective experience in experiments. So with matched performance and differences in subject reports, 
we think that we can try to probe some of the correlates of consciousness. Now, what does this actually look like in experiments? Well, one example of this paradigm has been applied in experiments involving visual motion perception. So in these experiments, participants view a stimulus called a random dot kinematogram shown on the screen here. And it's made up of some dots moving to the right, some dots moving to the left, and the rest of dots moving in random directions. And on each trial, what participants have to judge is what the dominant dot motion direction was, either to the right or to the left. By manipulating the ratio of dots moving in either of these directions, you can produce two conditions which yield the same perceptual performance, but different reports of awareness. So shown in the right panel here are results from this experiment where this was actually tested on trained rhesus macaques. So on the left hand side in panel B here, you can see that the performance levels on this task using a measure called D prime from signal detection theory, they're roughly equivalent. Whereas on the right hand side of panel B, you can see how often the animal was selecting a small but guaranteed reward, which is called the opt out response. Now animals can't tell us about their subjective experience, but if you train them on tasks to select a small but guaranteed reward when they aren't sure about what they've seen, you can then use that as a proxy for how confident they are in their subjective experience. So you can see that with more perceptual evidence in the high positive evidence condition, the less likely they are to select that opt out target. Now, thankfully, this works with humans too. And when working with humans, it gets a little bit easier because you can combine perceptual tasks with some subjective measure like questions about how confident people are in their perceptual judgments or assessments for how visible they think the stimulus was. So on the task I'm showing here, we had human participants view dot motion stimuli. And what people had to do in this task was to judge which of two dot motion patches contained coherent motion. So it was shown that across an array of performance levels shown on the X axis in the right panel, overall, people had more confidence in what they were seeing when the dot density was higher and less confidence in what they were seeing when the dot density was lower. So what this shows is that with this experimental manipulation, for any given performance level, you can create conditions that yield different reports of confidence in what was seen by manipulating the density of the dots. So what we're pursuing now is to try to identify the neural correlates of awareness using this matched performance, different awareness paradigm. And we want to try to determine which areas of the brain track these differences in confidence, visibility, and awareness. So if you're interested in reading more about the details behind this scientific paradigm, I recommend checking out the link to the book chapter down below. Um, this is a chapter that was co-authored with Jorge Morales from Johns Hopkins University and Brian Maniscalco from the University of California, Irvine. So Jorge has done fantastic philosophical and experimental work on consciousness, and Brian is one of the true pioneers in the scientific study of subjective experience. So I recommend checking out that chapter and um, reading more of their publications on Google Scholar. And I'd also like to note that other laboratories, including Megan Peters' lab at UC Irvine and Jason Samaha's lab at UC Santa Cruz, have also demonstrated some similar effects using match performance, different awareness paradigms. Um, so in an age where scientific replication is receiving very worthy scrutiny, these types of effects have been shown across several lab environments. Now, a second question my laboratory is interested in is how we can decode and manipulate unconscious brain activity. The human brain is made up of billions of neurons. And while we can be consciously aware of some of these processes, many aspects of neural processing actually remain below the surface of awareness. So we can ask what tools or approaches can we implement to try to better understand unconscious processing in the brain? Now, one new technique that my lab is using is called decoded neurofeedback. This is a technique that was pioneered by a research group at a facility called ATR near Kyoto, Japan. And there have been successful demonstrations of its utility in many publications in the last decade, including the ones I'm showing here on this slide. So to better understand what this is and how we will use it at the University of Florida, I thought it would break down that term, decoded neurofeedback, into two different parts. So first, we can focus on what we mean by the word decoding. So in these experiments, participants lie in a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner, and we show them different types of visual content. So in the experiment shown here, we showed them 40 different categories of animals and objects. 
And after they viewed all of these images, we could then use tools from machine learning to try to determine which types of brain activity corresponded to seeing images from different categories. And as you can see in this results figure, if we try to decode, uh, just as one example, seeing a butterfly versus seeing anything other than a butterfly. Um, and if you do that based on the neural activity in visual areas of the brain, and you then do that for every image category, you can usually predict what people were seeing with around 80% accuracy. So this is what we mean by decoding. You can predict what people were seeing based on the neural activity at each time point. And then we can try to combine these decoders with a reinforcement learning procedure to try to alter their brain activity over time. So in the second part of this term, in the neurofeedback portion of these studies, we can take a given decoder that we've built, um, let's say the decoder for snake shown here, and we can compare how an individual's spontaneous brain activity compares to the neural activity when actually seeing a snake. And we can then show people how well their spontaneous activity corresponded to the target category activity by showing a circle on the screen, which is marked by the activation likelihood label in this slide. So if you make the size of that circle paired with a monetary reward, then slowly over time, you can uh, help people make their spontaneous activity come to more closely resemble the target category activity. So they learn how to actually manipulate their spontaneous activity to match the target category pattern. So this method to alter unconscious neural patterns has led to the development of three different projects that we're launching here at the University of Florida. Um, we're gonna use this to study the neural mechanisms of learning. We're gonna look at how this method can be used to treat clinical disorders. And we're also gonna investigate um, different types of sensory processing too. So if you find this application of neurofeedback interesting, please reach out to me to inquire more as these are projects that we're just getting started this fall. Okay, finally, another area of the lab that we're actively studying is peripheral vision. So we only really see a small region of our visual field in a high degree of detail. So what we're interested in is to try to design experiments to assess how much of the entire visual field we actually see in our everyday lives. Now, many famous paradigms in psychology indicate that we actually see very little of our visual field. So as many of you have probably seen in your introductory psychology courses, if you watch a video of people passing a basketball back and forth, and you only pay attention to people in white shirts as they pass a ball, like shown here in the slide, um, most people miss surprising objects in the scene, like the black gorilla that's walking across the scene here. That's called inattentional blindness, and it's one example that shows that we might not see as much as we think we do. And similarly, studies of change blindness also show that if static images are alternated back and forth, and only one item changes in a given image, it can be difficult to spot where that change occurs. So the example I'm showing here contains a particular color change in one aspect of these otherwise identical two images. So while some studies indicate that we see very little of our visual field, like these examples that I just showed to you, there are other studies in psychology that indicate that you actually see a lot of the details and that your performance deficits are driven by processing bottlenecks in memory and attention. So there's actually debate surrounding this issue in the field of visual science. Uh, and to try to resolve this debate, our lab is very pleased to have received a grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation to try to replicate and extend some seminal work on this topic. So specifically, we're going to be studying how eye movements or saccades influence the ability to recognize when changes occur in visual scenes. So in the original work conducted by John Grimes, he developed a system where images would change at the very moment when people made specific eye movements. And this caused people to not notice drastic changes in the images. So in this example that I'm showing here, you can see that the hats of these two men are completely different. They've been swapped between the two images. But when this change was made while people moved their eyes, they didn't actually notice it in a free viewing scenario. So specific theories of consciousness make specific predictions about what you should expect from experiments like this. Higher order theory predicts that we only truly experience visual content when that visual content is subject to specific higher order representations. 
Whereas integrated information theory predicts that perceptual content is experienced independent of its reportability, recognizability, or representational format. So in addition to a basic replication of the original Grimes work, we've outlined a series of experiments where we're going to try to tease apart the conditions and types of visual content that lead to awareness to try to provide some additional data that can arbitrate between these two prominent theories of consciousness. So my laboratory is a part of a research team which includes Alan Lee, uh, whose lab at Lingnan University in Hong Kong will also be involved in this work. Um, Andrew Howen at the University of Wisconsin has been involved in assisting the experimental design. And David Rosenthal has been contributing his philosophical expertise um, to both experimental design and interpreting how these results will speak to current theories of consciousness. And last but definitely not least, um, I'd like to mention Francis Fallon of St. John's University, who led this grant initiative and has played a vital role in all aspects of its design and implementation. So I hope you found this review of my lab's work on consciousness helpful. Uh, as I mentioned before, these projects don't exhaust the list of what we're currently up to, but they do represent some of the things that I'm most excited about in the years ahead. So if you're a prospective student and you're interested in this work, please feel free to reach out to me over email, like the one shown here, or on Twitter. And one last item to note, we're actually doing a live Q&A session on September 1st. So if you watch this video before September 1st of 2020, please go ahead and register for that live event using the link below. So thanks, everybody. Looking forward to hearing from many of you soon. Stay safe.